Hello everyone, welcome to Random Encounter 274 or 274. My name is John O'Logan and I am in a brand new apartment. Uh, all last week, it was my moving week and we, we literally took a whole week to move, although one day to do all the furniture stuff. So we're in this new apartment and I'm in my new office and it is extremely echoey because I don't have any posters up. I don't have any soundproofing up yet. It's literally just me in a box. So uh, if I sound a little echoey in this episode, that is the reason why. I'll see what I can do about that uh, in post. But uh, for now, uh, I might be a little bit echoey. Uh, it was a ridiculously insane moving week. Um, moving day itself almost went well, except one of our moving guys, I, I can't figure out why, the elevator, the moving elevator wasn't working. So he decided to stick his hand into the mechanism of the door, which set off the emergency shutdown trigger, which resulted in the building... Uh, charging us $500 to get it reactivated until we convinced them not to. So that was fun. Um, and yesterday for the very first time, I am not a, I like to think I'm handy, but I'm not like, I don't have really any skills with that kind of thing, but I did install a light switch and a uh, light fixture yesterday and it works and I'm feeling very proud of myself. So that is my update uh, on my life. So I apologize if the room sounds a little weird, it should be fixed the next time we record. Uh, but now let's just move right along on to our panel today. So first up, we have Josh. Hi, everyone. And we have our uh, the go-to person for music around these parts, Patrick. Hey, it's me. It's a Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, so we're going to go in. We have some interesting games here today. Uh, we're going to do something a little bit different on the second half. But for the first half, we're going to look at a retro game that uh, I suspect that very few people in the audience have actually played. But... It's super interesting, like super, super interesting. So I suspect that I would imagine that just about everybody on this podcast, if they haven't played it, they are at least aware of The Legend of Zelda Link to the Past, the uh, SNES uh, classic Link uh, Zelda game. And it was the only Zelda game, well, technically there was BS Zelda, but it was the only Zelda game released in the West uh, for the Super Nintendo system. And... You know, there was nothing else really like it. And there were a whole bunch of clones that were out there. Like Genesis tried, you know, they had a couple of games that they they tried to duplicate the Zelda success. Um, but there was one game, one weird game that never got released in the West, which looks an awful lot like Link to the Past. So, uh, Josh, not that I want to pigeonhole you as our Zelda person, but uh, tell us, this game that we're about to talk about, Marvelous Another Treasure Island, how does it connect to The Legend of Zelda Link to the Past? Uh, so the thing that people might know that I, I call out as like the best known piece of trivia is that this is the first game directed by IG Onuma, mm. uh, who is now producer of all the Legend of Zelda series. Uh, and right after working on this was one of the directors on Ocarina of Time uh, after Marvelous. Uh, so that that's the main connection. Uh, it, it does look a lot like A Link to the Past. Uh, it's often cited that it runs on the same engine as A Link to the Past. That might be true. We don't really have a way to know that. Uh, At but very it does. Least it's, it, it, shares a, it shares the graphic style. For and, sure, uh, yes. It's very similar looking at a glance. Uh, yeah. Well, I guess my big question is, um, if this is the case, do any of the characters in the game have pink hair? I don't think so. Uh, you know, I didn't actually think about that. But no, I think most of the characters, there's blue hair. <laughs> there's blue hair. One of the main characters has blue hair. I imagine um, that if Link had blue hair instead of pink hair, it probably would have started more conversations in that era. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if we would all be so still talking about it, though. Because lots Link of anime characters have blue hair. I guess pink hair is not that uncommon. But yeah, uh, but blue hair is, I think, a little more acceptable. <laughs> and you could even pass it off as saying, well, it was supposed to be black hair, but the Super NES graphics, yada, yada. They did what they could. Um so like we said, this game was never localized uh, to the West. And the reason why, there, there are many reasons why, of course, it you know, was an SNES game at the very, very end of the SNES era. Uh, I believe the Nintendo 64 was already released and Nintendo did not want to release it, similar reasons, basically, as to why Star Fox 2 was canceled. Uh, they just didn't want to release a game that would, on a previous generation of system, that would look extremely dated compared to uh, the current generation. Um but I don't think that's entirely the reason. Why do you think this game was never localized? I, mean, I, I do think that's a big reason, but it, but it is also like a point-and-click adventure style game. Um, that's um, so interesting to me. I, 
I do think that it uh, may have had something to do with Earthbound not being a commercial success uh, mm. a year earlier. Uh, so it just seemed like we were all still a little bit cold on RPGs um, in 1996. Well, I mean, they just would have to release a really, a really stinking good ad to sell the game, right? I hear that works. <laughs> the stinking good ads. I hear that works really well. It's interesting to me because this game, you gave it a 70 um, and you, you liked it. You didn't love it, but you liked it. And obviously it's a, it's a, it's a late generation Super Nintendo game with a very unique uh, aesthetic and gameplay style. It seems to me it's really strange it was never localized. It would have been a good fit on the Game Boy Advanced. Or hell, even on the DS with its uh, point and click mechanics. Uh, yes, um, and and this I don't think is ever mentioned in the review. It's just kind of a bit of trivia. Like they have revisited the ideas that the Zelda team and the and Aonuma in particular have revisited some of the ideas uh, in this is not DS or Game Boy, but hmm. in the Legend of Zelda Four Swords Adventures, there are leftover assets in the game code of remade characters from this game where they had modeled them almost as if it had started out as some kind of remake or spiritual successor of sorts. Uh, and then even in the last 10 years, it's been mentioned in interviews as inspiring parts of games, uh, in particular Triforce Heroes. I know they mentioned it in the marketing for that. Uh, this game has a similar mechanic where the three boys stack on top of each other to solve puzzles. Mm. Uh, it's so interesting to me that this is a this is a first party Nintendo game, and it is not just unknown in the West. It's, it's it's unknown in the West, and it seems forgotten in Japan. That's interesting. That's just kind of fascinating. Uh, yeah, I would say it is relatively forgotten in Japan. Also, um, so like you you said, I, I like the game. I don't love it. I've played it twice. Um, mm -hmm. I, this was the second time I played it. I own two copies. Um, I actually had a friend go to Japan and hunt down a copy. Oh, wow. Uh, and the only copy he found was complete in the box. Oh, Couldn't find a single wow. cartridge anywhere. Uh, so I haven't opened that complete in the box copy. I ended up buying another copy on eBay the first time I played it. Uh, but, but that's just like, it's actually kind of hard to find, which is a little bit weird for a lot of these RPG or at least RPG adjacent adventure kind of game stuff. A lot of these, you can just, you just hear stories of there's tons of them. They love earthbound. They love final fantasy, you know, a, a Japanese copy of final fantasy six or earthbound is not worth nearly as much as an, a North American copy. Uh, mm. And so, yeah, there is, it is a little bit odd that it is that forgotten. Yeah. Well, let's move into the gameplay. So uh, I'm, what, what's, what's the gameplay like? So you mentioned there are three main characters uh, each with their own skill, uh, and they kind of combine with each other, and they can, you know, th go into the world and solve puzzles, essentially. Uh, so how, what's the gameplay like? Okay, so yeah, you've got three boys, uh, Dion, Jack, and Max, um, who are a bit stereotypical. The the short, fast kid, the big, strong kid, and the tall, jumpy, kind of lanky kid. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's not super original, but it gets the point across. Um, and then kind of arbitrarily the characters get different items that make sense for them. Um, you know, it, it's just sort of, I, I would say there's not a whole lot of reason to why, why Max can kick things and why Jack can use a fishing pole. <laughs> you know? um, well, it, we it, all that, have our hobbies, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so there's that, uh, but it is, it, it plays in a top down gameplay style, like the legend of Zelda would, uh, but you can zoom in to, well, I say zoom in at any point on the screen, you can stop it and investigate like mm -hmm. in a point and click adventure game. Uh, and then certain objects you can then zoom into like a point and click adventure game uh, and then interact with them in a closer manner. But you can, but you can stop and investigate any screen you want and kind of look around. Uh, it's not as robust as if you play um, a visual novel or anything like that where you don't really get a lot of fun quirky dialogue of because you click something uh it just kind of gives you an error noise or says you can't do that <laughs> um uh. so there it doesn't really reward you for trying a whole bunch of things uh, but it did seem a little bit ambitious for a super nintendo controller to be doing this um 
which is really my biggest problem with the game is just it's kind of clunky mm. uh but but no so you go in and you investigate but th- there are puzzles to solve a lot of the puzzles have to do with kind of playing a little mini game in the investigation screen or figuring out which which item you use one of the early ones is just there's a mouse who is scaring the teacher and every time you try and catch the mouse he runs out of the mouse hole into the out of the tent and then if you go outside to get him he runs back in the tent and scares the teacher so you got to put one boy on each side and kind of catch him and then the mouse begs for his life you know it's it's not real complicated uh other times it's like you need to there's a there's a bully who you it it has stolen some item you need and you've got to play soccer and get a goal past him and so you kind of play a little soccer mini game but he's too fast you've got to kind of fake him out by putting one boy on the left and one on the right and getting him to move left and then quickly switching to the other boy and kicking the ball you know um so and then other times there's a game where you play with a cannon and you're shooting rocks at little uh pirates <laughs> uh, so th- the game kind of goes places you end up accidentally discovering a boat and having to sail to a bunch of islands in the middle of your school sanctioned summer camp <laughs> mm, sailing to <laughs> islands eh that sounds like a mechanic that might be revisited later maybe <laughs> um but that that's kind of the minute to minute gameplay though is you are going through a story there is there is a story uh that's that in 1996, I probably would have appreciated more, uh, you know, time travel and becoming small, uh, other things they never, definitely never revisited before. This sounds very uh, familiar for some reason. It's <laughs> uh, so like, it would have been, it would have been more interesting back then. Uh, now you, now it is, it is a game you can easily play and see, wow, I see that this was the beginning of a lot of ideas that, you know, just weren't quite ready for prime time, maybe. <laughs> Um, mm-hmm. but you do, you just jump back and forth between investigation, find an item. How do you solve this puzzle? Um, it, it's not really a combat game. Um, there is combat that I wish wasn't there. Uh, uh yes. It, it kind of detracts from things. Uh, it's so simple and just seems unnecessary. Uh, there's even at least a couple boss fight kind of things, but it essentially is just throwing a ball at an enemy. <laughs> okay. So it's not like Zelda then. Not in any kind of smart way, no, um, because it is like you, uh, Dion gets a baseball glove and baseball, and for some reason the baseballs work like yo-yos and come back to you. <laughs> so, ooh, shades of Star Tropics. So, uh, so yeah, you just throw baseballs at everything, um, <laughs> and but it's only a few. It only happens occasionally, and it's always a little bit more annoying than interesting. It suddenly occurred to me that for Nintendo first party games, yo-yos are the kiss of death. <laughs> Marvelous. This is a, this is a baseball. Star Tropics. It just acts like a yo-yo. Okay. <laughs> um, well, it's it's interesting how the teamwork mechanics work, especially in terms of the puzzle solving of the game. Um, I, I know that there's no relation, but is it closer to? I mean, obviously, it inspired the it inspired uh, the uh, Four Swords. Is it anything like? Uh, I don't know. Mario and Luigi games, for example, where the two the two abilities work together, or is it each character kind of roams around the map by themselves? And uh, the characters usually roam around. You you can ro- ro- run around together or separately, uh, and so it is a little more. I would say like Four Swords than Mario and Luigi. It's been a while since I played Mario and Luigi, um, but it is kind of a this kid goes this way and hits a switch to open a way for Kid Two to come through and move a rock or whatever. So kid three mm. can do something. Uh, so you, you'll separate them out to do the, that kind of puzzle solving. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there are the, uh, the official teamwork mechanic is what it's called in the game where you've got to position the boys in certain ways around like a giant boulder. They all have to lift together or a big lever. They have to push together mm. uh, or something like that, where the game's kind of picky about how you place them. Um, but you've got to have specific kids on each side because for some reason lifting from the north is more important than lifting from the east or west. <laughs> you know, uh, Stuff like that is a little bit odd. The game seems much more like a, I don't know, slice of life style game than an epic adventure in the line of Legend of Zelda, for example. 
it, it is. It's not, it's not an epic adventure. Um, like it has a neat story um, that I won't spoil the end of, but I thought the end was pretty, I'll say anticlimactic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, for being a game about finding a another treasure island, you know, alluding to a treasure island and you know, finding something special, it didn't really seem to pay off. Um it's a that that does seem a little bit I guess awkward. Do you think that part of that might be the fan localization or do you think it was that was just built into the game? Like how was the localization for example? Cuz this is not clearly this is not an official uh, translation. It was never officially localized, but fans, you know, fans will do what fans will do and they will translate everything. Thank God. <laughs> right. So it, it's fine. It's fine. I'm sure they had to work within limitations of data and all of that and just do the mm-hmm. best they could. Um, there was never a time where I thought, wow, if this was translated better, I'd have a better idea of what to do. Um, <laughs> okay. If, and it's, it wouldn't have fixed the problem I have with the ending. Um, I do think that a modern kind of uh, expansion on it where the people could say more and kind of bring the areas to life a little better would help the game quite a bit. It would not mm. fix the end. It's interesting that this thing is only compatible with the SNES, con- or I guess the Super Famicom controller. It's a shame, especially with the um, Point and Click Adventures uh, sections that you couldn't use the uh, SNES mouse. Yeah, I mean, I, that had never occurred to me, but there's only a couple games that use the mouse as far as I'm aware. Uh, but yeah, you, you would kind of have to use both. You'd need Did the game come out late enough that the mouse was already out? The N64 was already out, so yeah. I have so to, I would assume right, so. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stupid question, yeah. It Mario Paint came, came out in like 94, so yeah. Yeah, it came, this came out in uh, 96, late, late, late 96. Yeah, like I, I remember reading about this game in Nintendo Power in 1997. Mm. They were kind of featuring it as if it might still come out uh, in, and that was early 97. So, I mean, this, the N64 <laughs> was still brand new uh, and they were still highlighting Earthbound and Harvest Moon at that point in history in Nintendo Power. So, I mean, it wasn't the last, Harvest Moon makes sense, but. Right. It wasn't the last Super Nintendo game in Nintendo Power, <laughs> but it was one of the last ones, I guess. That was the nice thing about Nintendo Power is they did kind of have, well, clearly they had the inside track at Nintendo, um, especially for first party games. Um, would you say that one of the reasons why, I would actually, you know what, I'm just going to say the main reason why someone would want to play this game is because they have tremendous nostalgia for The Legend of Zelda Link to the Past, and this looks like it. Probably. That's why I wanted to play it in the first place. I mean, yeah. Like, I, I collect games anyway, but... Like when I found out it existed, this one, and then also uh, the Game Boy game, uh, the Frog for Whom the Bell Tolls. Yeah, uh, like that was the inspiration I, for uh, th- that character made an appearance in Link's Awakening. Link's right? Awakening, right? Yeah, and so it's like when I learned those games existed and were almost just like prototypes, not not really, but they kind of seemed like it for the Zelda games that I already loved. Mm. I wanted to try them, uh, and, and so it is just a neat game to try. Uh, you know, that is a little bit the conclusion there in the the review is like, it's not bad, but it's really clunky and, you know, you might get fed up with it pretty quickly. It's a historical curiosity. Exactly. Uh, especially here where it was never released. Um, so we, we talked about it. What other aspects of Marvelous Treasure Island uh, do you think uh, basically influenced future Nintendo games, specifically Zelda? So we mentioned, obviously, the there's time travel mechanics. There is you go off on a boat to other islands. Right, I mentioned like the the totem mechanic is a it repeats a lot, uh, maybe not. Hmm. So there's multiple times where you've you've got to stack the boys in a certain order so mm-hmm. that the correct boy is like at the top or at the bottom to to make it make sense. Uh, uh, so that clearly went into Zelda later. Just getting that we talked about the teamwork in Four Swords, uh, getting a bunch of different items like Zelda already had that, but it mm-hmm. only had that once. <laughs> at this mm-hmm. point like, like a link to the past happened but that you see where they were a little more experimental i would say with the items you know you're solving puzzles with a fishing rod and you and <laughs> one of the boys has a remote control that lets him control little robots uh there's minecart puzzles um and, and just like kind of using weird stuff well surely minecart puzzles won't come back in the zelda series at any point <laughs> never <laughs> uh, not even this year. 
<laughs> it's this game's fault. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> you can see where maybe Aonuma was already kind of thinking outside the box with uh, with what he could actually use to solve a puzzle, and it didn't have to be a sword and a bow and arrow and a bomb. Uh, and then perhaps inspired future things like the spinner. That's the thing that really strikes me about this game more so than anything else. Like, yeah, it's a 70 thereabouts. It's a historical curiosity. But it seems like it's a game that packed in so many ideas that were eventually spun off into, for Zelda and other games, like titles of their own, like mechanics and ideas that deserve to be explored as central gameplay mechanics. But in this game, they were just like, it's like it was just overstuffed in a weird way with too much too much too many ideas that none of them could be developed properly is what i'm gathering from your review and what you're telling me yeah no i mean yes i i would say that you know i i don't know if i would ever say they weren't developed properly necessarily it's just you didn't get to stay in that world long enough to really explore it the way that like ocarina of time deals with time travel hmm. uh or or the way that the minish cap deals with you know, being small and then being large, uh, mm. you know, it just kind of, and there are other games that do this, right. Where they just, they had a bunch of ideas and it's almost like, this is the only time I'm going to get to do this. So you just do everything. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is one of those games. And maybe that's, maybe that's why Aonuma impressed them enough to end up on the Ocarina of Time team. Yeah. They were like, this guy has ideas. This guy has ideas of what he wants games to be even if he doesn't quite know how to put them into practice yet, but we, he can learn. It's, it's, it's a fascinating game. What would you say, despite its age and its shortcomings, of which there are you know, quite a few, like you mentioned, uh, what elements of Marvelous today do you think that are still enjoyable or hold up? Like, I, I do like the mini games. Like if you, some of the, the mini games feel like they, would, they belong in WarioWare, uh, that oh, you could geez. adapt them to a game like that, right? Not, be, not necessarily because they're fast-paced, but because some of them are just kind of silly. Mm -hmm. um, and and they're simple so like if you gave me a game and said here's just all the little mini games i would play that like that that would be really neat and fun uh it's just sometimes the the hmm. clunkiness around all of that got weird uh, so like that that i think aged well uh, that that was just fun and then the game looks really nice uh which we, we kind of have alluded to that because it looks like a link to the past but in some ways, I think it looks better than A Link to the Past. Uh, I think the little character models are... I mean, are I would there. hope there was five years difference between the two games. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, even uh, looking at screenshots right now, the trees are way nicer than A Link to the Past. They might look nicer than like Chrono Trigger does. Uh, and uh, the character models are, I would say, kind of Chrono Trigger-esque or of that quality. And... And then when you go into invest the investigation mode where you get a zoomed in picture of a character, those are detailed drawings of uh, a mouse or of your teacher uh, or a clock. There's puzzles where you have to like change the arms on clocks, uh, puzzles where you are scanning x-rays and you actually see all the little bones and such. So it's like anytime you get to zoom in on an object, they put a detailed sprite drawing of what you're looking at in front of you and they're good sprite drawings too yes like if you if, if you check out the review there are some screenshots on it and obviously we have many many more screenshots but like they look the game it, it's a pretty looking game and i mean like okay just another zelda thing like i'm looking at the they're they're, they're pushing something they're ma it, there's a button that says mash it and they're it looks like they're pulling on it and behind their head it, like sweat is coming off them and it's pure link pulling on something yeah no it's it looks like they might as well have just take in Link Sprite and change the head on it a little bit. Yeah. Well, let me ask you finally, uh, how does it sound? We talked about the graphics and everything. What is the soundtrack like? Yeah, that's what I want to know most about. Talk to us. Okay. <laughs> so the soundtrack, I would say, I like when you're playing, it's one of those games where when you're playing the game, you'll get the song stuck in your head and you'll kind of be like, this is nice. You'll remember it and kind of hum along with it. But when you put it away, you forget it. <laughs> And so it's like, it's nice, but no one's putting it on their video game music playlist uh, with Chrono Trigger and Final Fantasy VI and Earthbound. So it just ends up being a little bit forgettable in the long run. Uh, but there is, 
it's completely inoffensive. So it does sound like, I mean, like you said, it's kind of a a bit of a middle of the road soundtrack. Would you say that's fair? Yeah, that's good, fair. Not, good, good, but not like standout. Nothing that blows you away. Nothing that makes you go, oh my God, this is going to be considered one of the greatest soundtracks of all time. Yeah, like I, like I said, I've played the game twice. It's been a month or so since I finished it. And I remember nothing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's move on now to what could arguably be called one of the greatest soundtracks of all time. Um, Patrick, you are a regular on our sister podcast, Rhythm Encounter. Uh, and because of that, and you know, Rhythm Encounter always focuses on like, we have composer episodes, we have, we focus a lot on classic game music from the SNES and PlayStation and PlayStation 2 eras. But you don't really get much of a chance on that show to talk about more modern games. So you recently published a review on RPG Fan for a modern game that many, many people have been were eagerly awaiting that lived up to many expectations. And that was the latest HT2D extravaganza, Octopath Traveler 2. And it turns out that much like Octopath Traveler 1, 2 has an incredible soundtrack. Yeah, it absolutely does. It is six discs of ridiculousness as opposed to the first game's four discs of music. Um, And much of that sort of additionalness of it is it was is about the same amount of stuff to compose. But uh, for those who have played the game, Octopath Traveler 2 noticeably adds this day night cycle. And so almost every environment has um, a variation of its music that's generally softer different instrumentation, sometimes a slower tempo um, for its nighttime form. And so that's where sort of most of the added music comes from. It's interesting because the day and night cycle, as I understand it, plays a significant role in terms of gameplay where uh, path actions are different during the day and the night. So characters can basically do different things uh, depending on the hour of the day, whether or not it's dark. So it's interesting and smart that they also split that with the, uh, with the music. Yeah, one of the craziest things to me is that when you boot up the game, now you can freely switch between day and night while you're playing the game. But when the opening credits come up, it looks the game looks at I can't remember if it looks at the end game time cycling or if it looks at like your the system clock. Your system's clock. But uh if you boot up at night, you get a nighttime version of the main theme with the vocals Ooh. and everything. And it's all dark in the background. Whereas if you boot up in the day, you get the daytime version. That's pretty so, cool. Yeah. Like they really went all out with, with the day night cycle stuff and, and musically uh, that could have been a phone in. It, it could have, mm. it could have been so easy to just go, you know what, you know, just turn the volume down a little bit and cut the drums and we got our nighttime version. Uh, but no, Yasunori Nishiki, the composer, went all out in pretty much every area and town theme I can think of, and especially with that opening title track uh, in in making multiple versions that you'd want to listen to both. Mm. Uh, like, each has its strengths, and it's it's interesting listening to both, not just in the game, but again, just That's putting soundtrack, the soundtrack yeah. in. Well, for those who have been... If you're listening to this podcast, I assume you know what Octopath Traveler is. It was uh, the first, uh, the first one of these games, and with you know, it 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 looks like pixel art from the SES era, but with like depth and particle effects and things like that, it just brings it really to life. Uh, the original one had eight main characters. Their stories really didn't intertwine with each other, uh, which was a major criticism. But one thing that no one could criticize from the original Octopath Traveler was its soundtrack, which was unbelievably incredible uh and obviously patrick you very much enjoyed it um that was that was uh, uh that was his first soundtrack wasn't it yes For video it was games. His, to my knowledge it was his first full game soundtrack um, mind-blowing yeah he's he'd been he'd been doing a lot of um like university studies uh classical and classical to commercial work but I, I, yeah square enix kind of just picked well i guess it was probably team asano that picked him up out of nowhere Mm. um but like like he's relatively young like he's younger than me i think he's he's in his 30s like and he's like i mean he really came out of nowhere with that first octopath soundtrack like blew my mind and my big fear going into to listening to the octopath toast he was like can you even hope to live up to the first one Mm. uh and not only did he, but I, 
I think, you know, moment for moment, note for note, I think the, the soundtrack for two is better than one. I have like a handful of places where I prefer the first. Um, and I think I note this in my soundtrack review, but um, Frostlands from the first game, uh, the environment music outside of Flames Grace. So it's a winter theme and winter music always has the possibility for greatness. That mm-hmm. might be my favorite song uh, from the first game. And I don't, I don't think there's a winter music theme in two that tops that. Frostlands was just like pure it was a slam greatness. dunk. Yeah, it wasn't then, a slam like, dunk. It was it was a what's a, what's a winter sport? It was a it was a puck in the net. That's there you go, and, uh, and and so but in so many other areas, I expected like like the battle themes in the first game were so good, and like the final boss music or like the secret boss music, like Daughter of the Dark God and like Gates mm-hmm. of Thinness before that. Like I was like, how are you going to do all that again without just copying what you wrote the first time around? I, I don't know how he did it, but there is a ton of great battle music in this game. Um, and one of the great things they do is, and there's actually a special soundtrack that was packed with the Japanese limited edition that kind of plays out for you how this works. But the eight characters' main themes, their character themes, kind of get woven into battle themes in different Ooh. ways. So in one way is that the intro, like the intro four bars will be a little different uh depending on who you're playing as your your main during that time like in like a story path right Mm -hmm. um and that's not featured on the soundtrack the full ost you have to buy this this rare like i think it's it's called like exclusive extended battle tracks or something what the ost does have though is for when i say final boss there's like four different things that could mean but like um for like the final bosses for each of the characters story paths like their chapter four or chapter five ending sequence mm-hmm. um that final boss music that's the same song for all eight characters but in the b side about a minute a minute and a half the way in uh nishiki weaves in uh the character's theme alongside the battle theme and he does it with all eight he even does it with agnia where where her theme is song of hope which is mm-hmm. like this vocal piece um and fits that in like like the final boss battle theme it's it's so smart it's so well done i'm always impressed when when composers manage to make that work so it sounds so clever it just yeah. sounds extraordinarily clever and you you consider a uh, song of hope to be the 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 theme song of, not the actual theme song but like because octopath traveler does have a theme song but well so the octopath traveler main theme is it's the same song from the first game so if there's yeah. sort of a a, a theme that is sort of the unique theme of two. I think it is Song of Hope. Mm-hmm. Um, I think not only is it Agnes' character theme, but I think it's sort of designed and it represents the journey. I think, you know, a lot of promotional materials around the game are going to suggest this and further reinforce it. There's already talk of a new break, break and boost concert oh. coming. And when it does, uh, I guarantee you Song of Hope will be near the end, if not the final piece. Like, it, it's like, it's an important piece of music to the game. I can't tell you how excited I am for that. In fact, I like I have a copy of Break Boost and Beyond, which I believe I bought from you, Patrick. Yeah, I think you did. And that's and oh, also that uh, I don't think the video is up for yet, but the audio from that uh, I just saw uh, Square Enix has posted it on free streaming services, YouTube and Spotify and all that. I think oh. it's audio only. I don't think it's the video content, which is a shame because that's video that's when you're cool. Yeah, but the music is still great, and people should go, like, just get on your favorite streaming service, because that just happened, like, a week ago that they put that up. Well, let's, let's, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna make this into a a little mini version of Rhythm Encounter, uh, and we're going to actually play uh, Song of Hope for you, uh, to give you a taste, and uh, Patrick, what, what should they listen for in this, in this song? Anything that specifically stands out to you is like, hmm, that's so good. Yeah, you know, sometimes I... I've... I made that sound way too sexy, yeah. so... <laughs> no, it deserves to sound sexy. Mm, that's so um, good. <laughs> when instruments play the same melody in unison, it can feel a little hackneyed, a little forced. Um, but given the the style of this song, you're going to hear some things in unison. You might even hear vocals in unison with another instrument. Um, but there's something entirely and wonderfully folksy about this, so expect flute and fiddle to match up for example at different beautiful and uh enjoy awesome let's give it a listen
So uh, if you were listening to that and you thought, wow, that's pretty damn good. Uh, I, there's two things that you should probably do. One, you should probably, you know, get the soundtrack. Uh, or two, you should play the game. Uh, so, Patrick, what would your recommendation be for someone who wants to listen to the soundtrack? Do, they, do you think that they should uh, listen to it all at once and like sit down, listen to the whole thing, which would be a stunning achievement because it's six discs long? Or, or do you think they should just break it up to in parts? Yeah, I'd, I mean, I'd break it up almost by disc um, if you really want to listen to the full soundtrack. Honestly, I think the best experience is to play the game first. Mm-hmm. Um, if, you've already played the, if you've already played the game, I think listening through it isn't as daunting an experience because just from the song titles, you know what you're getting. Mm. Um, I think without that context, you'd really want to take it slow. You'd I would do multiple listen of the character themes and the main area themes, which the the eight main area themes are um, are variations of the character themes as well. Um, so like um, Toto Haha is probably one of my favorite songs, and that's a that's a variation of uh, of um, Ochet's theme. And so spending a lot of time listening to that before you do the rest of the soundtrack is really good because those themes. You're going to see them recurring again, not just in the battle themes, but in other ways. I mean, the the motif work here is just solid. Mm. Um, and then uh, get, give yourself some time and space for when you get to that block where it does the eight final battle themes with the character themes, and then like <laughs> the super final battle themes where like there's this operatic tenor voice that just like dominates and like everyone loves that song. Mm. I think there's three versions of that song too because uh, different things. But dude, it's just like. It's so good, it, yeah. But you want to take you want to take your time with it. Ah, that makes sense. Yeah, it's set. It's seven hours. Uh, so listening to it in one day is like. I mean, if you have a road trip, maybe if you have a road trip, be a good thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would not want to listen to one of the battle themes while I was on a road trip because I feel like I would get a speeding ticket. Because <laughs> those things make yeah. your blood race. Yeah, yeah. You'd be you'd be risking speeding. Well, another interesting uh, thing that I read in your review is that uh, you actually have kind of a personal connection to the soundtrack in a weird way uh, when you discovered that a portion of it was actually recorded in Nashville. Yeah. So the character themes uh, and the main environment themes, that opening theme that I talked about in its day and night version and a handful of other tracks uh, were recorded at Ocean Way Studio in Nashville, which is a pretty well-known studio. Um, If you work in the commercial music industry, and certainly if you live in Nashville, you've probably uh, you're probably familiar with it. And well, people think about Nashville. I mean, generally the idea of Nashville is country music, but the reality is that Nashville is a mecca for musicians of all kinds. Yeah, I, most commercial music, certainly all pop music, rock music, like so much happens there, and and there there are multiple places for orchestras to record. Um, and so, once upon a time, a very young Patrick Gann uh, had considered becoming a composer himself. And he uh, went to Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee for just one year, uh, my freshman year of college, 02 to 03. Um, And if you're really bored, you can look up the few soundtrack reviews that I did during that first year and see if I learned. I bet bet my my musical vocabulary expanded for some of those early reviews, Um, but they're probably still not very good. Anyway. um, (laughs) Patrick, I've read some of the very earliest reviews on the site. I guarantee your reviews are better than some of the earlier reviews that we have on the site. I have like a three sentence review of like the Wild Arms soundtrack. It's not appropriate. Like (laughs) I need to go back and fix some things. That's all I'm saying. There's only one song to talk about from that game though. So it makes sense. Don't don't you dare say that. The opening (laughs) theme and Clash and a Promise. Those two songs are worth talking about. Um (laughs) No, actually, like Michiko Naruki is a genius, and I like most of that soundtrack. Um, Patrick, two thousand and two, the Wild Arms Vocal Collection. Oh wait, you have another one here. You have Wild Arms Music, the best. Feeling Wind. Oh, Feeling Wind is a piano collection. Yeah, Feeling Wind is uh, Feeling Wind is what happens when you have too many beans and you ride your horse. Yeah, I feel like they named that really <laughs> poorly. I'm like, oh, I'm feeling wind. Are you smelling wind? Um, yeah. So anyway, <laughs> um, so I, I was <laughs> in Nashville. <laughs> I was in Nashville for a year of my life, and I think on two occasions uh, I got to visit Ocean Way um, for projects that some of my classmates and peers were working on. Uh, and it's it's really an incredible studio. And so 
Uh, I have very fond memories of being there. I think I even got to, I don't think what I did got recorded for a final project, but I did like, I got to play a baby grand uh, on track for like a country song at one point. Yeah. Like just to mess around. Like they gave me the, the chord progression and I just mm-hmm. got to play along as they were doing, I think they were just doing sound checks. So like, I don't think anything like that didn't go on any album or anything, but mm. It better not if you 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 can expect some residuals at some point. Actually, I'm not sure that that's how the music industry works. The music industry doesn't work with the residuals, does it? Uh, it can, but it has to be in the contract. Mm. Um, so it can, but it generally doesn't. Yeah. Um, anyway, it uh, it was a really incredible place uh, to see. And so when I saw Ocean Way mentioned in the liner notes for the album, which again, Square Enix has been doing this incredible thing for about six years now. Their liner notes, even though these are technically import CDs, because they've been selling so much of them on their North American uh, e-store, um, like the printed liner notes are dual language now. They'll have it in its original Japanese, and then they'll have it in English. So, like, it'll be like ten pages of like interviews and composer commentary. And oh, like, that is so cool! Yeah, like it's it's they've been doing it for a while now, and I'm a huge fan of it. Um, you know, the one thing I disliked about that Break Boost and Beyond Blu-ray was that there are not English subtitles, mm-hmm. uh, which they have they have gone on to uh, fix. Uh, some of the newer near Blu-ray concerts and the the Saga concert from a year or two ago had English subtitles built in. So, I mean, they're re- they're really focusing on international audience for the music too now, which I think is really great. I mean, I have to admit that, that there's a good reason for it, which is it's it's gaining a bigger and bigger audience here in the West, not just with RPGs, but also like concert game concerts are becoming extremely popular here. Right. Uh, and that's only that's only good news, in my opinion. Yes, I agree. So finally, let's let's cap this off with uh, you. Your opening line of it is you say you think that Octopath Traveler 2 original soundtrack is going to be the music of the year winner for 2023. Yeah, I'm, I just finished playing Final Fantasy 16 and I am still standing by that statement. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's only the end of July, so we still have six plus months, um, but it's that good, huh? I think it is. Uh it, I don't see anything else standing up to it. I mean, there's lots of great music out there. Um, mm-hmm. And I'd love to give a quick comment on 16. You know, um, I think the best thing that soundtrack did was Masayoshi Soken has a lot of practice with um, clever and timely reuse of very important themes. And Final Fantasy 1's and the series prelude and main theme get used so well in so many variations throughout that game. Um, I think that's the thing I'll remember most about that soundtrack, but, um, I don't think it stands up to, um, like what I think are some of his best works on the 14 expansions. Like I'm a huge fan of, uh, um, heaven's word, for example. I mean, I was under the impression that it reached its peak when they mashed it up with stand by me, but okay, whatever. Your taste <laughs> may vary. <laughs> Yeah, right. To each his own. Uh, but yeah, I, I thought the 16 soundtrack had great moments. I think the theme themes used was really good. But um, and it's an eight disc soundtrack. I mean, I'm sure we'll have a review of it at some point. And it's big. It's very impressive. But mm, for my money, Octopath Traveler 2 still still taking the cake. Well, if we do have a review for it, I have an odd feeling whose name might be at the top of the uh, the byline. The same person who covered all of. 16 so far well maybe not um you are i was about to say that you are by far there's you know some people i would say that audra right now is uh the most prolific reviewer on the site although you know in terms of games but in terms of sheer amount of content on the site patrick i don't know what percentage would just be your name but it would have to be a substantial amount because you have contributed so many reviews over the years it's stunning even if one of them is only three sentences. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's. I've done the check. It's it's just over a thousand soundtrack reviews and about a hundred fifty game reviews. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I'm proud of that. I am proud of that. Um, but I, keeping up with these big sort of mainline releases is very difficult, as a lot of our game reviewers know. It's tough to do it with the soundtracks as well. And um, I'll just say for our RPG fan music sort of subsection of the site you know uh lately there's been 
uh, some hustlings and bustlings from some people <laughs> that I hadn't heard from in a while. I'm pretty excited about. We have some upcoming stuff from Greg, which is mm-hmm. super cool, and uh, and um, also uh, Zach Hubbard, the mm-hmm. the printy of time himself, uh, mm-hmm. has some good stuff coming up. I think I saw like two or three reviews come through in the last month. So like, there's going to be some great stuff uh, on the section that's not from me, and I'm always excited about that. Well, I would just like to say for the record that uh, the very first words, according to the website anyway, the very first words that you ever wrote for RPG Fan stand the test of time for just about every single soundtrack that I can think of. And it is, well, this music is strange, to say the least. (laughs) Uh, Which is that for? That is uh, Baroque Original Soundtrack. Yes, and uh, that music is strange. This music is strange, to say the least. Well... Let's move on to the discussion question to finish off the episode now. And uh, because we're sticking around with, uh, we're going to stick with the Rhythm Encounter inspiration here for the last question. So I want to ask you uh, both, what was the very first piece of RPG music that really connected with you? Now, this doesn't necessarily have, this isn't your favorite piece of music or your favorite of all time. It's just a song that you heard and it was just like, it just clicked with you somehow. And it it stuck with you for years after that. You You always remember your first, that kind of song. So what would you say, Patrick? Yeah, and I think about this from time to time, and it's interesting. You know, I, I definitely played RPGs earlier than this. The first RPG I played was the first Final Fantasy, hmm. and, and I played the Game Boy Final Fantasies, and I played Zelda games and all that. Um, but I think the first time I was like, I realized game music was like a thing, and I wanted to get into it, was the first time I... I feasted my eyes and ears upon uh, Secret of Mana. Um, that that opening title screen first. There's that there's that wow. wonky sound effect that I don't know what the heck that or is. It supposed to be flammy. I think so. That was my best attempt at it. Yeah, the the man of beast himself. Uh, but then right after that, you get the dun 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 dun. It's just a simple piano line, and then over time it it builds after one repetition, and then it becomes orchestral. Um, that is, that is, the, and that's by Hiroki Kikuta. And, and I think that was when I first realized, like, there's, like, the aesthetic, the art. And I, you know, I couldn't have been more than, like, nine or ten years old when I when I experienced this. But, you know, between those visuals, and I think a lot of people also know that that title screen, there's incredible posters and fan art of it. You know, the three characters standing on like the root of the mana tree and there's these beautiful pink birds flying by. And like you put that visual against that music and it's like that to me is freaking timeless. And and just as as a shout out to him, um, you know, uh, my little brother, when he got married in 2007, um, he had two different pieces of game music uh, used in his um, like processional. I think, um, I think like bridesmaids and mothers of the bride and all that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. got, um, they got um, the, that opening theme from secret of mana. I think it's sometimes translated where angels fear to tread. And I played that on a keyboard. And then, uh, and then uh, when, when his, uh, his blushing bride, Amanda, came down the aisle we played dearly beloved from kingdom hearts and my friend molly was on violin while i played piano for that so like for my little brother like those two opening themes were definitely his secret of mana's opening and kingdom Mm. hearts is opening but for me like secret of mana like love it Mm -hmm. molly i I approve of uh (laughs) i approve of the name of his bride (laughs) (laughs) yeah amanda's cool amanda is cool Amanda, I don't know Amanda, but I I like it. Something about that name is just like yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, Josh, what about you? What uh, what piece of RPG music first connected with you? Okay, so I am I'm gonna ignore Zelda for this topic. What? Uh, <laughs> Zelda was, you know, as far as RPG fans concerned, the earliest RPG I ever played. Right? Uh, mm-hmm. I probably wouldn't have called it one back then. Uh, but uh, the first RPG I traditional rpg i played was super mario rpg mm-hmm. um and that music has now been stuck in my head for over 20 years <laughs> uh 25 years it's been a while uh in in particular uh as soon as you asked me this question 
my mind immediately went to uh, the Mushroom Kingdom when Mac has taken over, when you like fight that first big boss. Uh, I had to look it up. The song is apparently called Here Are Some Weapons. <laughs> <laughs> which okay. seems a little bit odd but i guess they are weapons they're little sword guys uh little shy little shy guys i guess yeah uh, so yeah i mean that's that's kind of where it started for me and they kind of hooked me in uh you know it's like we we now now it's basically all i listen to right is video game soundtracks but that's mm. i would say that game is probably the turning point for me uh and just early in the game fascinating realized there was something there uh and yeah, like I, I, I basically don't listen to non-video game music. <laughs> mm-hmm. so. I'm as I get older, and I mean, I understand as you get older, your your opinions get fixed sometime. But I'm I'm seriously at the point now where when someone wants to have an argument whether or not Zelda is an RPG and we should cover it, I just kind of want them to be beaten to death with Cadence's shovel. <laughs> I'm <laughs> I'm just like I don't I don't care at this point. It's part of the site. It's it's an adventure RPG. It's an action RPG. It. it it's, we cover it. Sorry. Zelda is covered. We, we cover Zelda here. Yeah. Sorry, not sorry. Sorry, not sorry. So last, that was my American impression. Sorry. <laughs> Instead of sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, so for me, my first piece of RPG music that really connected with me, I mean, I, I love the Final Fantasy IV, well, two, two soundtrack. That was the first RPG I really ever played beginning to end and loved. But the song that really made a massive impression to me, I just listened to over and over again, isn't even from, it's from a game, but the, this version of it isn't. It was a version of Matoya's Cave. It was just, it's just a crappy MIDI version of Matoya's Cave that was on like one of the, one of the early internet Final Fantasy sites where it was just like all of the Final Fantasy music, but it's just MIDI versions of it because we couldn't upload actual tracks back then because two megabytes would like crash the entire internet if you tried uploading it. Mm-hmm. So it was just a MIDI version of Matoya's Cave. And I was just like, there's something about this melody that is mind blowing. And it also had, the, it had the, uh, it had the lyrics to the, uh, to the right of it uh, from the uh, vocal album. And it was the French version and also an English translated version. And I remember trying to sing the English translated version with the MIDI and it was just, it did not fit at all. And, uh, but I have some very fond memories of that. So that's, that's my earliest RPG song memory. Um, but for everyone out there, uh, if you have strong RPG memories, memories of the past memories, and you, you want to show off your, your RPG love, a great way to do so is uh, our emblem, which you can find on our store. Uh, so if <laughs> that was, that was a, quite a transition I just did there, but that's uh, a good one. So if you're looking for a way to support us here at RPG Fan, we opened a store. Uh, you can find it at www.rpgfan.com slash shop. And you can find our logo, our our emblem, our shield, uh, just about everything. <laughs> stickers, mugs, baby onesies, all kinds of things. So give that a look. And it's a great way to support us here at RPG Fan. Um, if you want to support us here at Random Encounter, you can do so by listening to some of our past episodes. The last episode we did was uh, it was great. We talked about uh, a few recent games. Before that, we were doing a lot of Naughty 3 stuff and then a lot of Final Fantasy 16 stuff and a lot of Tears of the Kingdom stuff. So if you're into that kind of stuff, give those episodes a listen. Josh, you were on the Tears of the Kingdom episode, I do believe, and I believe you were quite enthusiastic about it. I don't remember anymore. (laughs) I've done a lot (laughs) of stuff since Tears of the Kingdom came out. But yes, the game is great. (laughs) Um. It is not the only podcast we have here at the site, though. We also have Retro Encounter, which is RPG fans' podcast of many retro topics. Uh, Zach has been mining the store lately. Solosi is coming back soon. But the last two episodes were fascinating. They were uh, looking back at Final Fantasy VI. And it was really, really cool uh, editing these episodes because I got to hear some opinions about Final Fantasy VI that I've never heard before. And clearly, I mean, VI is one of my favorite games of all time. I love Final Fantasy VI. So talking, hearing people talk about some of the moments, uh, the big moments, especially that I I just sort of internalized uh, it. That was really cool. So I highly recommend that. Uh, We also have Rhythm Encounter, which is RPG fans music podcast, which we talked a little bit about today. Uh, The next episode is something very special, in my opinion. Patrick, what's our next episode? Oh, next episode, Rhythm Encounter, we're going to be hearing uh, an interview that Hillary and I did with... um, 
a young lady named Kara Comparetto. Uh, she has her own YouTube page and uh, also live streams on Twitch. She is a pianist, uh, but also a keyboardist, which is to say she uh, performs not just on piano, but also on um, pipe organ and harpsichord and other instruments that use keyboards. And uh, she's recorded a lot of incredible covers. Some of them, the arrangements are submitted by other people or she uses existing arrangements. But her current project, uh, which she's almost done releasing the YouTube videos for, um, and then it'll be available for streaming in full. And you can also purchase it digitally, I think. Is she's doing the entire Chrono Trigger original soundtrack using piano, harpsichord, and pipe organ. Every single song features at least two of those three instruments. Uh, some of them have all three, and it's all her like synchronized playing. And if you go on YouTube, it's uh, it's videos of her performing, and she's like cosplayed up as like like Marl and Luca, and like it's it's she's great. She's also really funny. She has some really you know, interesting thoughts, ideas, and opinions about uh, music covers and arranging for piano. Um, so I think it's I think it's a really good episode, and I hope everyone tunes in. Yeah, her cover of Black Omen dropped on YouTube a few days ago, and holy crap! Yeah, yeah, solid. Yeah, all of all of her Chrono Trigger stuff is good, but I heard yeah, I heard Black Omen uh, last night. I think I I watched the video, uh, and it was just yeah. She's so super good. cool. I mean, I appreciate that she is, she's not just on piano. She's, you know, all kinds of uh, keyboards. I personally, I would like to hear her play uh, Tara's theme on a keytar. Yeah, I don't know if she's done keytar yet. I should have asked. But the pipe organ stuff always impresses me because oh, yeah. you, you use both your feet to play notes as well. It's not like sustained pedals on a on a piano. You're like playing notes with your hands and feet all at once. She also has a great video, and we I think we featured the some of the audio from it on the episode. Um, one of my favorite videos of hers is she did the entirety of Dancing Mad, all four parts, as mm-hmm. piano and organ. And that video is also incredible. She's uh, cosplaying as uh, Tara for one of the instruments and then Kefka for the other. Like, she's just, <laughs> she's just great. Yeah, she is, she is absolutely incredible. Her YouTube channel is amazing. It has so much amazing free content on there. And she does sell the, uh, uh, she does sell the albums as well. Although she is apparently sold out of the uh, physical print of the Chrono Trigger album, which is a yes. shame. But yes. I'm, uh, I'm a proud owner of one of the 250 printed copies of that. Nice. And I pre-ordered it the moment I could. Nice. But there are lots of digital copies available. So I highly recommend you give that a listen because holy crap, they're so good. They're so good. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, if you'd like to get in contact with us here at a Random Encounter, you can do so by firing us off a message at podcast at rpgfan.com. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, if you have any ideas or you know, feedback about these episodes. If you have any ideas for discussion questions that we could talk about, we'll credit you with them. Anything you'd like to share, fire me off a message. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, if you'd like to send me an email directly, you can do so at jlogan at rpgfan.com. You can also find me on Mastodon at John O'Logan at mastodon.social. And yes, indeed, I join threads just like everybody else, it seems. So you can find me at John O'Logan on threads. I don't have any content up there yet. But yeah, giving it a shot from what I've heard threads is basically Twitter before Musk. I've just ruined it. So, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll bite. Um, but we have other people on here with an online presence. Josh, where can we find you online? Uh, so I go by Watcher Joshua. Uh, you can find me on Instagram where I share game screenshot stuff and then also on threads and also on Mastodon. Uh, uh, I am sharing stuff on threads, uh, RPG fan stuff on threads. <laughs> every day <laughs> yeah is it uh what how, how are you enjoying threads oh it's great i'm really happy with it it's twitter from it's basically twitter 2020. from 2020 <laughs> yeah exactly it's <laughs> i don't want to say it's back when twitter was good but it's back when twitter back before twitter was broken. back when twitter was better <laughs> back back when twitter was twitter uh, uh so no, with moderation uh, and less nazis that's that sounds like a sale to me uh so yeah, Watcher Joshua and I I do share lots of RPG fan stuff and then other articles and such. So Cool. And Patrick, where can we find you online? Yeah, so I'm slower than you guys. All I, all I still really have right now is Twitter. It's at Gameadactyl, uh, G-A-M-E, and then the letter O, and then Dactyl. You can figure that one out. Yeah, you don't want to let go of that handle. 
that, that, that you want to keep that handle right there. Yeah, it's a good handle. <laughs> so I'm still on Twitter. Uh, I might get to the other things if I can. Uh, I'm slow. I'm lazy, but I, I probably will. But for now, that's where you can find me. You can also email me uh, pgan at rpgfan.com. I do check it regularly. So if you want to hit me up, that's a good way to get a hold of me as well. Cool. Uh, if you enjoyed this podcast, yep, you listening right there, please share it with your friends to help us get the word out there. You can rate us on iTunes, your other podcast players of choice. I would love to read some reviews. Uh, Josh, Patrick, I would like to thank you for joining me this evening. We ran a little bit late this evening, uh, so thank you for giving me your night. I, As always, I truly appreciate it. Yeah, no doubt. It was a great yeah, it's time. It's been great. It's been yeah. marvelous. It's been marvelous. <laughs> well said, Josh. Well said. It's perfectly marvelous time. Uh, okay, well, I've got to go and put on my fishnets now and dance over a chair. So uh, <laughs> uh, any day I get to end the podcast with a cabaret reference is a good day. So thank everyone out there. Thank you so much for joining us. And everyone listening out there, whatever you're playing, have fun.